Welcome, everybody. I'm here with Owner Occupied, episode 18. Today, we have special guest Kevin Clark. Kevin is an adjunct professor at NYU with a lot of real estate background, and uh, he and I get into a really great discussion today. Uh, we start with a little bit of his background and, uh, and what he's been up to. Then we jump right into Zillow and Airbnb and talk about how uh, he and I first engaged on Twitter and our, our each unique perspectives on where we see the future of those two platforms going as it relates to rental real estate. We move right into a discussion on real estate commissions and the NAR and why real estate brokerages and commission structures are set up the way they are today. Uh, we actually get into a pretty heated discussion about why we each feel like things are the way they are and how they could be better. Uh, some really fun kind of uh, back and forth there. And then everyone's favorite topic, real estate as an inflation hedge or not. Uh, Kevin is a little bit famous on Twitter for his position that real estate is actually not an inflation hedge. So I pick his brain on that and kind of push back a little to sort of uncover some of his thinking there. And then we wrap up with a discussion of some of Kevin's uh, favorite and least favorite deals that he's done. So thanks for tuning in and uh, I'll uh, jump right into it here. All right, Kevin, let's get started. Welcome to Owner Occupied, everybody. I'm thrilled to have uh, our third ever guest on the show, Kevin Clark. And uh, Kevin and I are excited to uh, have a good conversation today and uh, hopefully bring some great value as we sort of traipse through some of the hot topics in real estate today and uh, lean on Kevin's deep knowledge here. Uh, so Kevin, if you wouldn't mind, maybe start with just a couple minutes on who you are and what your background is a little bit. Sure. Thanks, Peter. Uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I'm Kevin Clark. Um, I am a real estate professional based in New York. I've been doing this about uh, 20 years, a little less than 20 years here in New York. Um, prior to getting into real estate, I was in um, university fundraising for about seven years, at the primarily at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and then in New York. Um, during that time, I went back to school, got my graduate degree in real estate finance at NYU. Uh, shortly thereafter, was asked to teach the real estate economics and market analysis class, as, as, uh, and I've been a member of the faculty there since uh, 2007 or so, uh, give or take. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so went back to grad school, got into real estate, did um, asset management at the portfolio level, I'm sorry, portfolio management for a pension fund business called ING Clarion. And then didn't really didn't really like that, but had an opportunity to uh, get on the um, the deal side when we were selling a few assets. Really liked that part of the business, so decided to transition into brokerage. Uh, went to work for a company called Massey Knackle for a few years, um, and then went out on my own uh, in uh, 2008, um, and have been primarily doing that as sort of a broker advisor, and still continue to teach on the side. Okay. Awesome. So lots, lots there. Um, so are classes back in person at NYU or is it still virtual? Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, we, um, NYU had a, um, had a hybrid program, um, where students were allowed to select either in person or online. So, mm -hmm. um, although I, I've been teaching online there since around 2010, we, uh, NYU actually put a, had a pretty, pretty big push, into online learning, um, and I had the opportunity to develop a curriculum for our for our, our core class there, and so I was very familiar with it. But um, and I do teach; I actually teach live and I teach online, uh, same lecture class. Um, so it's it's great for the students' continuity. But uh, we we did have a, we had this period of two semesters where students could either come to campus or stay home, and and. You know, it's the worst of both worlds, right? You you can you know teaching in person is great. It's very dynamic and and interactive. Teaching online can be great also if you you know if you if you work hard at it. But combining the two, it's it's uh, it's pretty funny. But in the fall, they're supposed to come back, so that that should be great, hopefully. Awesome. And before we move on from, from New York, from your teaching career, uh, if I remember correctly, didn't you have Moses uh, Kagan come in and and do a little guest lecture there? How'd that go? I, I did. I did. I had, uh, I, I did. I was, I was hoping to have you as well. I think where you're on the agenda uh -huh. as well. Yep. Um, Moses was great. It was, uh, it was, it was, a 
it was great. He's a good, he's a, he's a very casual, um, very smart guy, but a very casual way of talking about his experience. He's very humble. And it was great because a lot of the students, you know, these are grad students who, you know, real, most of them are either finance or development focused. So, you know, what Moses is doing is I think what many of them dream to do. So it was a, it was a fantastic, uh, and I, I'm, I'm really hoping to, to lean into real estate Twitter and get a bunch of people in awesome. uh, this, this summer semester is really short. So, um, I don't know that we'll even get any in there, but, but regular classes, I'm hoping to get at least a couple of a semester. Very cool. Well, you know, we met on Twitter and, you know, I think we followed each other for a while here. One of the things I've always appreciated about your perspective that you bring to the real estate Twitter community is uh, you, you bring, I think, a more rigorous economic approach or perspective to the conversation um, with maybe a little bit of that uh maybe ivory tower would be the cynical way to describe it, but you, you have an ability to look at things in a macro way that I think a lot of local, uh, local real estate investors don't necessarily think about all the time. Um, so I think that, you know, maybe a theme through our discussion today, let's, uh, go back a little bit to one of the things we were discussing recently on, uh, on Twitter was about Zillow. And I've had this thesis for a while now that Zillow and Airbnb uh, have the ability to come into long-term rentals and really disrupt that market quite a bit. Um, I feel like the their market power is such that because they've controlled and captured the consumer mind share, they have the ability now to act as an intermediary between potential tenants and landlords and and because of that, extract a lot of value from that, uh, from that relationship. So I'm trying to remember what it was actually that you and I were kind of sparring over related to that. Is this ringing a bell for you at all? Yeah. I mean, I think we, I think we taught, you were saying, um, you know, Airbnb, uh, sort of moving into the, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think the conversation was, was sort of that, um, when we have, dominant players like Zillow or, or Airbnb come into the mix, it's going to sort of end brokerage or end the sort of the, the, the status quo, the way it is right now. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, and I think my, I think my position was more, um, I think there's, I think it's a huge, it's a huge business. Um, and I think that there are certainly areas where Zillow and, and Airbnb very well will probably, try to make inroads in that market. But I think, um, I think the economics and not, not the ivory tower economics, I think the literal balancing the books of doing that kind of business is I think pretty, pretty misunderstood, um, in the, not from your perspective, but I think, um, you know, it, it's an expensive proposition to have people showing apartments and, and it's, it's very time, time intensive. I mean, I think some, some, uh, operators, and I, I would um, consider you in that group, sort of professionally managing properties where you know your inventory, you know you, you have a, you know you have a, you get in there, you get it painted and cleaned, and 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 you get the process. That's going really quickly. The reality is, is even at the professional level, that's a r relatively unusual thing. Um, many landlords do not communicate with their tenants very well. They don't know that the tenants are leaving. Um, and these are billion dollar companies, not just mom and pops, mom and pops struggle with this particularly because a lot of, a lot of, a lot of mom and pops are not making their money. Um, their primary revenue from their real estate there, it's sort of a yeah. passive because they're doing something else. And so the management intensiveness of that, I think that, you know, Zillow could do it. I don't think it's a particularly profitable business. So I don't necessarily think that they will do that except in the low hanging fruit area where, um, you know, Airbnb, I think was bragging about the fact that 60% of their, um, of their rentals are, are a month or longer in New York city. Well, part of that is because it's illegal to, to do Airbnbs in New York city. <laughs> so, um, the fact that they have, you know, that they're not breaking the law, good for them. Um, but I think only 60% of the time, not breaking the law, apparently. <laughs> right. Right. And, and, and I think, I think on the more, I, you know, I, I, 
the other 40%, I think you're allowed to rent out a room and you're oh, like, you okay. know, there's okay. that sort of thing, the traditional way to do it, but an apart renting an apartment, you can't do for less than 30 days in New York anyway. So, um, uh, so anyway, I think my, my larger point is I think the, there's a lot, I mean, this is a massive, massive business and extremely fragmented. And I think there, I would, I would rather hear the narrative that, um, you know, hungry, ambitious real estate agents and brokers want to come in and try to make the, make the market a better place than being afraid of Zillow, which, you know, Zillow hasn't made a dime in, in their eye business, in their eye brokerage business or eye buying business. I'm sorry. So, um, you know, they've got a lot of things they're trying to do, which on paper seem like they should do well, um, but they're very challenging. And, um, and the market's a very smart market. I mean, the information is readily available to just about anybody who wants to look for it. So, yeah. um, so, so I think there's a, so many good things to unpack here. So there's a few different topics. One of them is Airbnb and or Zillow inserting themselves further into the, into the rental real estate marketplace, uh, which I have a lot of thoughts on that because that is directly in my wheelhouse. Sure. Something, another interesting topic is Zillow. And I wanna, I'm going to, I'm going to go further with that in a second. Another interesting topic here is Zillow's, um, I buyer slash becoming a broker slash the general topic of real estate commissions as it relates to home sales. Right. So, right. You know, famously, the United States has an incredibly high uh, commission or cost of transacting property. It's 6% is pretty standard, 5 6%. Other countries, much, much lower. That is a, you know, there's, you know, that, that we could talk about that, make a whole podcast on that. Um, sure. So backing up to Zillow for a second uh, and Airbnb, my thinking on this is Zillow and Airbnb have consolidated demand or they've consolidated market mind share of consumers. So to, to, to put an edge on this, we can't lease property around here without using Zillow, like not, right. not effectively, not in a reasonable length of time. So, right. you know, for years and years, it was free to advertise on Zillow. Uh, and over time, Zillow acquired, uh, Trulia, they acquired hot pads, they've acquired a number of other internet listing sites that we use to advertise our rentals, because that's where people are looking. Well, we here within the last year or two, Zillow sort of sufficiently combined enough market share. So now they charge and, and property managers across the country are paying anywhere from about 80 cents per listing per day up to like two to three dollars, depending on how many units you have listed for rent, and and the, actually it, it varies by geography as well. And basically, Zillow is like, hey, we have we have the attention of the people who want to rent your properties. If you would like access to them, you need to pay a fee. So okay, great. And if you look at if you look at their financials, that's a relatively small portion of their overall revenue, of course, but it's growing quickly. And what I think it speaks to is the fact that Zillow now, that's in my mind is only step one, is charging a fee. They have many, because they've captured that demand, there's a lot of other things they can do. And let me give some examples. Zillow could start enforcing a standard rental application fee. Zillow could start enforcing a standard rental application and it's like, hey, you want to list your properties for rent on Zillow? You need to use our standard rental application because we think it makes for a better consumer experience. Zillow could start enforcing um, standard lease terms. You want to post your properties for rent on Zillow.com? You need to agree to use our standard lease. And uh, the lease is going to be, you know, fair and balanced in, in, in regards to the power dynamic between the, the landlord and the tenant. I don't, I don't ever envision Zillow actually physically managing properties, like showing, you know, you know, pulling people to go show units or, uh, dealing with turning over the units between tenants. I could absolutely see them doing the things I just mentioned. Another one that comes to mind is you have to, you, you have to allow Zillow to be the one to collect your rent from the tenants again, because it makes for a better tenant experience. You find your property on Zillow. You apply through Zillow, you pay your security deposit through Zillow, and you pay your monthly rent through Zillow. 
Um, that could happen. And I think is, I think we're going in that direction. And I think Airbnb can do a similar thing. Um, and I think I see a lot of people, when I bring this up, a lot of people in the industry start, they, they almost explode. They just can't even like understand what I'm saying because they don't like it. <laughs> they don't like the idea of it. Right. It's like, yeah, I get you don't right. like it. That's not the point. The point is this company has such, has so consolidated consumer mind share and demand that they're going to do this, like it or not. So what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, Cribdilla, my, my handle on Twitter is, is, um, is actually the name of a, a rental startup that I, I, I tried to do and is sort of on hold because of the pandemic. Um, but, uh, th this is a market or, or, a, um, an area that I've done a lot of research on. And I, I, I spent a lot of time right, trying to raise money and, and, and had a built an app. And, and, and so I, I, this is a business that I, at least for a snapshot in time, I think I understand pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, my, my perspective, I, I think I share your concerns actually, um, about Zillow and, and uh, playing a sort of monopolistic role in the market. Um, but I think that, um, a couple of things, um, a couple of, I think counterpoints, I would say that the first is I don't, I don't think that Zillow would do, some of the more extreme things that you're talking about, like application fees, because I think application fees, at least in New York, and I imagine everywhere else, um, for a long time, those were profit centers for management companies, you, you charge 100 bucks, 150, 200 dollars, of course, for applications. yeah, they it still are. Two things. It, yeah, it weeds out uh, people who just spread yep. applications around. And it also provides, you know, an opportunity to, to generate some revenue off of the time you're, you're spending. Um, uh, it, New York, interestingly, actually just eliminated that by legislation and, and you can't charge more than 20, you can, you can only charge $20 a month. I'm sorry, $20 per application. Uh, that doesn't even co cover uh, a, a credit check, uh, a credit and background check Absolutely is, is $34 ridiculous. at the cheapest. So, um, but yeah, and, 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 you know, so a lot of, you know, there, there are people trying to work around it, but I think that I, I don't think it serves Zillow to do something like that. And I, I think that would, but the other larger issue is I think in some markets and the one you're, men, you're mentioning yours, Zillow is the dominant player in a lot of markets. It's a little bit more fragmented than that. You know, there's apart, apartments.com is, is uh, CoStar and CoStar own the, just yep. like Zillow owns a bunch of the platforms. There are some independent platforms out there. Um, you know, I think you and I have exchanged this on Twitter. Um, but, but um, in a lot of markets, um, Craigslist is still the number one place that people go first when they are starting to think about renting. That doesn't necessarily mean they rent through it, but um, where Craigslist is, you know, the sort of information um, warehouse, the thing about Craigslist, which is interesting and, and, and our studies of this sort of found was that um, it's a linear, it's a linear listing platform, meaning it, it ages very, very quickly. So if you're in a market that's active and that listing is seven days old, you have a pretty high probability that that's probably been rented already. Um, and, and Zillow, and I mean, in New York, it's, a, it's um, Zillow owns Street Easy and Street Easy, even though they all have the same information, Street Easy is sort of like our version of Zillow for you. Mm -hmm. um, that information dates really, really quickly. And, and the, the marketing expense that agents use, there's still a lot of bait and switch. There's still a lot of dated information that's out there. So until, unless and until Zillow and, and the listing platforms do a better job of um, um, calling the information that's in there. And I don't know that they necessarily have the incentive because again, their fee, if, if it's listed on Zillow, the, you, they're charging you for it. It's on you as the agent or the broker or the landlord to clean that data up and take it off the platform if it's no longer available. But on the flip side of that, I've already spent the time marketing the property. I've already spent the time uh, listing the property. I've put all that thing and I've got seven other units that I'm not listing or five other units that I'm not listing that I know I can use this as sort of a, you know, chum the waters to get people to come in. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I'm sure a lot of that goes on. That's the Everything you just described me has just confirmed that I'm never going to move to New York because that everything you just said in the last <laughs> well, five minutes made me furious. <laughs> everything from York the rental Austin. application to the brokers yeah, doing the bait well, and switch thing. <laughs> yeah, and you know, but it's any dense dense market. I think is. I mean, I think I, I don't. I don't think it's exclusive to New York. But I'm sure I do you're right. think it yeah. is, a, is, is a particular problem. But I. But again, going back to your your point, I do think that. I do think that there are areas where uh, Airbnb and, and Zillow could move. I mean, shockingly, um, I, you know, and this is some, I, I posted this on Twitter, so you may have saw it, see, uh, you may have read it. Um, but this is something I personally just found out that I didn't even realize Zillow was doing because I, do, I don't do residential. I'm, I'm more of a commercial broker um, exclusively. But um, my sister-in-law is, is an agent in New York, and she just accepted some referrals from Zillow and Zillow is taking 30% of the fee of the commission on if their buyer buys that property. That is shocking to me. Oh, that's not shocking um, that to me. A, we have a we have like 20, 20 to 30% referral fees around here. For for Zillow? For like if Zillow, if, not another agent. Like if I if I if I as an agent have a buyer and I send them to your market and say, Hey Peter, you know, take care of this person, uh-huh. let's talk about a referral fee, and it's 15, 20, 30 percent. Totally, you know, totally there. Yeah. But Zillow, because the way Zillow, think about the way Zillow does this. They're getting the buyer leads by I as an let's say I have a listing, I'm the listing agent, I'm hired to sell this property, I list it on Zillow. Zillow filters the traffic mm-hmm. in a very sort of opaque way to buy, to buyers agents. And they, so they are inserting themselves on the side of the, uh, and now that's fine. I'm, I'm a big believer in buyers brokerage, <laughs> but Zillow is actually now inserting themselves in the, um, in the, in, in between the agent being able to make a living. And, and, and that is, it, that's one of those things where, Interesting. um, and if you do the math, I mean, I did the math with my my uh, my sister in law. Zillow will make more money in that transaction on the buy side than either the broker or the agent. Um, and that's yeah. Uh, I I suspect that kind of thing could could be a m- monopoly sort of challenge at the state level. Quite frankly, anything um, that makes that's, realtors that's angry funny. is 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 a good thing in my book. So <laughs> it actually doesn't make me angry because again, I don't I don't. But I think the the you know, people laugh. I think, you know, buyer's brokerage, there's a reason why buyer's brokerage exists. And the reason it exists is not because buyer, because agents want to make money as much as their um, buyers request it. There's oh, a huge I, I'm a big believer in, in buyer's, buyer's agency and, and buyer's, uh, buyers using and working with someone who's advocating for their interests, right? Because we right. all know that the listing exactly. agent, the listing broker you know, when they do a dual agency, which means they're representing the buyer and the seller, they're re- th- that's like an oxymoron. You can't really do that. And so I, I think that should be illegal yeah. nationwide. Um, and, but where, where, where I get frustrated with the buyer's agency discussion is I feel that the buyer's agent should be compensated on an hourly basis for the work that they do. So if you if they're running around showing their client this property and that property, they should be invoicing their client weekly for the hours that they spent and getting paid. And this whole the buyer gets a commission from the split from it it, it creates all these fucked up incentives that really distort the whole marketplace and and make it so that for example if you were to to publish your your property for sale and and lit in fact, for years, it wasn't even possible to list a property for sale without a buyer split. It, there's a field in the MLS where you put here, you know, and of course, 99.9% of, of, of brokers put 3% as the, as the split for the buyer's agent. Um, and it's like, no, how about zero is, is what I'm sharing with your buy with your, with you, the buyer, your agent, why don't you pay your agent? And if, if you go and tour one property, put an offer and buy it, then maybe you're going to owe your buyer's agent 200 bucks. And if you drag them around for two and a half years to 1500 different properties, then you're going to owe them, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or whatever. Um, we need to sever that very archaic 
way that this transaction is is being done if we're ever going to unravel the mess that is the MLS and everything else? Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 I think that the first thing is, is that you, the, uh, there is, I think, a, a very, um, um, I think, uh, I mean, I, I got in, into a Twitter battle with, with some pretty big, pretty big VCs on this that, uh, primarily because they're, they're, uh, primary investors in Zillow, I think is the, why they, they talk their book on this, but, um, you don't, you, NAR actually doesn't national Agent, uh, association of realtors actually does not control what the commission structure is. They were, they, they, they may recommend it. Oh, they explicitly are not we, permitted to do so. Cause that would be a, and, antitrust neither, is violation. Any, and, and neither is any broker, Correct. Uh, you know, if we, uh, understanding the broker for the audience is, is the broker hire has agents that work for them as, as contract employees An agent, a broker can't tell an agent what they, what they're supposed to work for. Right. Um, and, and, and in, in, you know, in New York and in other markets that I I'm personally aware of, but I want to, don't want to say nationally, um, 6% is, is hardly ever done. 5% is much more common now. And what is even more frequent is if there's a 6% fee or a 5% fee, there it is, it is bifurcated. So if it's a direct deal, the direct deal may be 4% or 3.5%, but it is not 5% or 6% if it's a direct deal. Most agents are offering that out of the gate because well, yeah. um, because fees are well, but it didn't used to be that way. It, well, of you know, course, but property values compressed. have gone up quite a bit. Well, that's right. I mean, I guess that's fair, but I think so has competition in the in the. I mean, we we haven't seen a massive amount of transaction volume change over time either. So um, I think that you're. Um, I would I would from a from a what's fair, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to have a discussion where the art, where the discussion is whether things are fair or not. I think, I think, um, part of the issue with buyer's brokerage and is I, I do believe from a negotiating standpoint, having the rules understood by the entire market, um, is better for the seller. Um, I frequently have sellers make decisions about who they want to sell to because of the terms of the deal, meaning they know what they're going to net and they decide where they're going to net the most amount of money. So if it's a direct deal, because the fee structure is lower on a direct deal, they will pick that. If it's better because the outside agent brings in a buyer who's paying more significantly more than the other, and they'll net more at the end of the day. The other issue with a buyer's broker is Many people think that they are better at either understanding the transaction or negotiation than they actually are. And frequently it's because they're negotiating their own asset. I actually, yeah. when I sold my apartment in New York, I did not represent myself. I, I do hired the same. a residential agent. I've got a property for sale right I, now listed with another broker, even though I'm a broker for that exact reason. Yeah. You're emotional. You don't, you don't make good decisions. You get angry. You can't change the tone in your voice. It's everything's yep. personal. Um, and so having that layer and, and I do, while we say 6% is a lot of money, you know, it, what's ironic. And I posted this on Twitter. We keep talking about this is, you know, you get the, you get the advocates who are in, and I'm not suggesting you're one um, who think I buying is the future where fees are significantly higher than brokerage fees, um, is, uh, irrespective of what actual sale prices are. And sale prices are actually lower for iBuying than they are for uh, openly marketing a property, which they should be. Um, so you're talking anywhere from 8% to you know, 12, 13% is, is some, are some of those structures plus discounts in pricing. But there's you know, when you have a, buy, a buyer's representative and a seller's representative at 5% of a deal, that's somehow anathema to capitalism and, and, and negotiation and fairness. Um, and, and it ten, it's, it's, it's frequently comes up, I think when the markets are crazy because it is absurd, right? It, I, I agree with you that if, if I was in the, if I was in the residential sale business right now, and I don't even have to list a property and I've got 20, 20 offers and it, things are closing for cl for cash and my right arm and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it, it's kind of absurd. 
that commissions are, are that high. But the seller of those properties can negotiate a lower amount. They can also sell them for themselves. They can do those kinds of things and make those kinds of decisions. Um, taking a more macro look and a broader look, you know, you talk about eight, you know, somebody walking in, walking a buyer around to 20 or a hundred properties. I've represented sale properties, not in the residential side, but in the commercial side where I've shown the property a hundred times and there's no buyers. Yeah. And, um, you know, when the market is slower, you certainly earn your money and you earn your, well, that, you, so those brokers um, should be paid by the hour as well. The whole thing is, is so messed up. I'm, I'm, I'm going to rebut you. I'm going to yeah, do a poor job of it though. So here, here we go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so wait, can I, can I throw one little state? Can I, can I yeah. throw one statistic out for you? Because I, yep. I really think that this needs to be, um, you know, I don't know if this is the million dollar listing of of, of the real estate brokerage business. Being a real estate agent sucks. Um, I, I run my own company because I, 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 I'm good at what I do and I, I'm, I'm, I'm good at negotiation. And I'm, I have a sort of skill set that I think I'm, is, I'm sort of well suited for this, but most agents aren't. And, and the average agent in New York city alone, there's something like 80,000 registered agents yep. in the, in the five boroughs of New York or the, in New many. York state, I should say, and something like Right. But nationally, the average real estate agent makes $41,000 a year. Right. $41, That's part of the problem. A year. That's part of the problem is that it's not professionalized and you've got a bunch of part timers running around. Right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, but we, <laughs> we can't. Well, I have always, no sympathy for realtors. My, my concern is for okay. consumers. Realtors go can ahead. either go get another job or, right. you know, I negotiate agree. with their broker, whatever they need to do. Uh, where I get frustrated is no, when I see with fees the way they are. What's that? And so that's even with fees as egregious as they are, as, I know. is what your point is, I think. Right. Okay. Well, the money's going somewhere. It may not be going to the real estate agents themselves. I think the brokerages are, are taking a lot of that. Um, so w where I get fr you know, people who just whine because they feel like the fees are too high that's irrelevant, right? This is like you said, this is capitalism. If they don't, if they feel like the fees are too high, they can shop around, negotiate, not sell their property, whatever. That doesn't concern me at all. What concerns me is what I love more than anything in the world is a well-functioning marketplace. And this, okay. this goes both to, both to rental marketplaces and for sale marketplaces. So like, I'll give you like, I love the idea of a place where buyers and sellers can come together and through the magic of capitalism, experience price discovery, right? It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And what makes marketplaces function well is when, the, like you said, the rules are understood by everybody and the product that is for sale needs to be... Um, visible to everybody, there needs to be transparency and there needs to be some sort of structure. You know, like when you search for size 12 shoes on Amazon, if you got yo-yos listed in with your search results, that would make for a poor experience and it would, it would not be conducive to a good marketplace. So when I look at the residential real estate space, specifically the for sale marketplace, people buying and selling homes, I see a fundamentally broken marketplace in multiple ways, and it makes me really mad. And I blame NAR for that. They and so that that's sort of like the original sin. Um, I feel like the NAR, through a combination of a bunch of different weird things that that all play off of each other, part of which has to do with the MLS is being controlled by NAR, which means that. So I'll get, so I'm a licensed broker, but I'm not a realtor. And a lot of people don't even know that that's mm -hmm. a thing, but the States are responsible for licensing real estate agents and brokers. Realtors are nothing more than a trade organization, by the way, who, who, who are organized for the purpose of enriching realtors. <laughs> they do not advocate for homeowners, even though they hold themselves out as doing so. They're a trade organization for realtors. Um, and so when they're advocating 
before Congress, make no mistake, they are advocating for the interests of their members. Um, so, but, so, but that's true of the bar association. That's true of the medical field. That's true of every oh, every organization that represents professionals. I mean, sure, I, but I I don't think you know, the I, medical I don't, so I don't think the, those other trade organizations hold themselves out as explicitly being like a consumer advocate. And I feel like the NAR does. I think if you, this oh, may not oh, be he, neither here I mean, nor there, but um, yeah, no, no, I don't, I don't, and I'm not gonna. I mean the. I think that there is, I mean, I think we, we can, I think there's a, we have a lot of, we have, there's a lot of things that we agree on. And I think that, I mean, I think that the, the first MLS was established in, I think, 1865 and it was established for valid reasons, which was essentially you had, um, you know, you have people who are working on behalf of someone to do something and they needed some level of protection. And it, it, it actually it does. I mean, if you think of Zillow as essentially a, an MLS, that's all it is. It's mm-hmm. not. It is a publicly available MLS. Um, that, that level of information that was provided and transparency by that first MLS in in 1865, I think, is you know. Now there has not been nearly enough um, disruption in it, and I would totally agree with that. I think. Part of the, the, I think there's two things that I would say where I, I think we have a fundamental disagreement on. The first is, is that the reality is, is going back to your point about brokers, brokers actually don't make much money in the current, in, in the current economic structure of a, of a, of a brokerage firm. Um, 70% of the, of the list is 65 to 70% goes to the agent and the mm-hmm. broker shoulders all of the, the remaining 35 five or 30% goes to the broker. So for instance, Compass, Compass's valuation at $5 billion is absolutely insanity. Um, they're not making any money and their structure very likely will not allow them because lo- brokerage is a very, very low margin business. You hire as many agents as you can. 80% of the business is done by 20% of the agents. And the reality is it's much more like 90 or 95, 10 or five. Um, the best agents make the most amount of money um, and it is a very, very, very low margin business. Um, now I agree with you that there is, uh, you know, making things uniform, but part of the problem is, is the definition of real estate is every single parcel is unique. So we do not, I mean, there may be areas where a lot of information is readily available because it's tracked housing and it's, it's, you know, in New York city, as an example, lots of information is wrong. And the only thing that that's correct is the survey and the survey is not something that's usually publicly available. So, um, you know, I, I, it's, I'm in agreement with you. I wouldn't have tried to start a real estate platform if I thought that it was perfect, but I do think (laughs) the other thing, I think the first sale market is, is, um, is going to be much, much harder to to disrupt than people understand because. I completely um, agree with that. I I completely agree with that. and, And the reason for that, I think is, is that you have, just like you and I just said, we wouldn't even sell it. But here we are both real estate professionals, hopefully pretty smart guys, or at least we think we are, and ambitious and understand the value of the dollar and understand markets and understand price discovery. And we won't even sell our own homes. The idea that we we would expect um, people to not make exactly the same rational decision that we are, where they, I mean, I can't tell you how many, I mean, I, I was last year, I was working with a legitimate billionaire, legitimate registered billionaire wanted to buy some property in Brooklyn because he thought the market was going to collapse like everybody else did. It didn't, but he thought it was. So we chased a bunch of industrial properties. Yep. Mark, prices didn't come down to where we were. But every single time I presented him with something, he wanted me to tell him it was a good deal. This is a mm-hmm. guy who has made a boatload of money in the financial markets and did not understand how because it's not his wheelhouse. And I understand, and totally legitimately, his point was, I'm paying you to do this because I don't know. And I'm, yeah. I want you to give me good advice. Now, there's lots of people out there who are giving bad advice. And, and at the end of the day, it's their decision, not, not, not mine. But it is one of those things where when you're talking about 30% of somebody's pre-tax income going out the door every day, every year, to support their housing decisions and for a vast majority of the, of the 
homeowners, it is their primary source of wealth, they're probably going to be relying on people to do this for a long time. And they should be better. They should be better licensed. I mean, the licensing is ridiculous. The continuing ed is ridiculous, how much information is not known. But I can't tell you how many times I've told sellers to hire a real estate attorney. Don't hire your brother-in-law. Don't hire your friend's neighbor. Hire yeah. somebody who knows what they're doing. It's going to cost you a couple more dollars, but we're going to get this deal done. And they still don't do it, which is totally irrational. And we end up, you know, wasting time. And they hire their sister-in-law to sell the house, and they, you know, their friend to do the contract. I mean, the, all of those decisions are totally irrational. So you get you get a lot of irrational parties involved. I I I can't see how we're gonna how Zillow is gonna step in and do things. Now I do think there are things they're gonna do that could make things better, could make things worse, but I don't think they're gonna be um, a, a dominant player. And and I think I think they would be worse off for it too, to be honest with you, if they tried. I think I disagree with you, but I'm gonna put a pin in it because I want to move on and I want to make sure we okay. cover a, co a couple good topics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, it's gonna be good <laughs> um so i can't we can't move forward without giving you a couple minutes to defend yourself uh <sighs> when it comes to real estate as not being an inflation hedge I'll, and i'll give this just a couple minutes of, of preface here so going going back years to when i first got in the got in the real estate game which was 2008 i bought my first property uh, even back then my business partner and I, you know, the, the fed was dumping money, uh, to stimulate the economy. And, and even back then there were fears over inflation and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. One of the reasons my business partner and I got interested in real estate was because we felt it was an effective inflation hedge. We're like, okay, this is great. We're going to buy these assets and, uh, we're going to, um, we're going to leverage them with fixed rate debt. Beautiful. So the value of the assets going to go up with inflation, and probably even do better than inflation. And the the value of the the fixed rate debt is is like going to be decreasing relative because the 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 buying power of the dollar is going down. So fast forward years and years, never thought about it again until uh, I started following you on Twitter, and you you're constantly sparring with people on this topic, saying, uh, "No, you're wrong. Real estate <laughs> is not an inflation hedge. Here's why." Um, <laughs> and your arguments are probably correct because you, I think you know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, but why don't, why don't you explain a little bit about, you know, what, what, what's going on there, I guess. Cause I think it goes against a lot of people's intuition. Right. Well, okay. So the first, the first thing is, is that I, the, the, um, I first, uh, approached this topic when I was actually a graduate student and, and in, in, uh, we had to write a, a paper and do research on some stuff. And I actually did, I wanted, I, I wanted to, to, to mathematically try to prove how it is an inflation hedge and where that information comes from. And the only information I was able to find, um, and now this is going back some time and there have been some studies, so I can't, I can't speak to things that have, have, have been published since then. Um, but, but the only information that, uh, it hinges on is essentially rents tend to go up over time. Therefore, if you buy real estate and your rents are increasing, it is an inflation hedge. Okay. Rental real buy estate that, specifically. Well, any, well, real estate, I mean, real estate for income. I mean, if the only, the only, if you're talking vacant land, um, we can have this discussion about vacant land as well, because the 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 only reason why the value of vacant land increases is because the demand for that land increases, especially if you don't if you're not getting any. I mean, I mean, presumably you could rent it as ranch land or something for, right. for grazing or something. But but even in that purpose, you know, probably you're paying your taxes, I would guess. But your the demand if the demand for that land increases, the price will go up. If demand, if demand for the, in the space market goes up, rents go up. If demand in the space market does not go up or, go, or decreases, rents will go down. The level of inflation has absolutely nothing to do with demand. Now, if you're in a mar if you buy in a market that has great demand characteristics, it's a great investment in a low inflation market. It's a great investment in a high inflation market. The difference, though, is if we are anticipating inflation, 
by definition, we will expect the cost of capital to go up. If the cost of capital goes up, cap rates go up, right? The, and cap rates are, there's four com primary components to a cap rate. Interest rates are one, but expectation of rent growth is the second one, and oftentimes is as important, if not more important, than the, than the overall cap rate. Mm -hmm. The third is credit, and the fourth is, is, expect, is uh, treatment of real estate taxes in the tax code. So if you have debt increasing, cap rates have to expand. If you don't have adequate demand in the market, so you don't have a high expectation of rent growth, you're not going to get cap rate compression. If cap rates compress, values go up. So you're going to be buying an asset that is depreciating in value on the underlying value of the asset is going down. If you have, even if you have rent going up, you can have massive cap rate compression, I mean, expansion. From 2008 to 2019, we had over 100%, something like 130% of asset valuation uh, or asset appreciation, I should say, came strictly from cap rate compression, going from eights and sevens to four, fives and fours, if or nines really, and, and into fours, fives, fours, and in, in some markets, including New York, into the threes. If you if you believe that cap if the that markets are cyclical and we should expect cap rate expansion the underlying appreciation of the asset is not going to happen. In fact, we're going to get depreciation because the asset value itself will decline. And, and that's going to outpace rent any rent enough. growth? Well, rent growth is only going to happen if you have demand. I didn't say it's a bad, I, I've never ever said it's a bad investment in, in inflationary times. What I'm saying is, is don't buy it for the wrong reasons. Gotcha. Buy it because it's a great asset. Buy, buy, buy it because you have constrained supply. Buy it because you have... Um, the underlying fundamentals of the market buy it because in construction prices are really high and you know asset and land prices are really high which is going to hopefully constrain the amount of supply coming into the market therefore you should get some rent growth because demand's coming into the market and supply is is on hold but when asset prices are high that's when we build the most so we have to absorb all the stuff that's getting built into the market before we can expect rents to go up Okay. Theor theoretically, in every every market's different, though. You have to you have to measure, you know, like Ash Asheville and Raleigh. They're ex they're experiencing huge population growth. That I would argue is absolutely. If you can find a deal that makes economic sense, who cares if we get inflation or not? You're going to do well because you're getting a huge population growth. It, is you it know, useful oil, though to to lock up long term fixed rate debt? in an inflationary situation and in, in a leveraged situation? Um, well, long rate, long, I mean, depends on your definition of long term. Five, if you, let's say you over, let's say you pay a sub four cap in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, which is an absurd idea. It's a tertiary market that, <laughs> that probably never seen cap rates in love Allentown, have family that lives out there. I'm not, I'm not dissing Allentown. But that is a very, very low cap rate to pay in a tertiary market. So uh, let's talk through it. You pay a sub four cap, you put enough leverage on it to make it make economic sense. So you've got to think you're putting 70% on. Mm -hmm. Five years from now, debt's not at whatever it would be for that, that asset. Let's say two, two, eight, two, seven. Let's say it's at five, four and a half. You if debt's at that number, your cap rate is expanded from sub fours to sixes in that market. True. So you now have a capital call. You have an asset that's depreciated more than the equity that you have in the, pro in the property. Your debt costs have gone up substantially on a month to month basis. So your debt, cur sub debt service coverage ratio is going to be all out of whack. You're either going to do strictly swapping debt. So you're not going to be able to pull out money. Or you may be in a situation where you either can't borrow or you're going to have to sell the asset or have a capital call. That's the sort of nightmare scenario where, where, where I'm saying yeah. rents don't go magically up if you're in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Now, if Allentown is experiencing an unbelievable population growth, that's a demand thing. I don't know Allentown. Maybe Allentown is. But so it's, it, and here's I guess the thing. Let, let me just say one other thing. Yeah. If unless it's a magical thinking idea, right? Where if we have this one thing, then this other thing happens. If we have high, high 
um, inflation, rents have to go up. It's a, it's gospel. It's going to happen, right? If it's not that, then the opposite would have to also be true. Low inflation means no rent growth. If, if, if the cost, if the dollar value is not going up inf- or deflating as the Bitcoiners are saying, then we, we can't expect to have any rent growth. And any real estate professional, if you said that to them, you'd say, you would say that's insanity. Of course you mm-hmm. can have rent growth go up in, in low inflation environment. And in fact, we haven't had high inflation for 20 years. Right. In the last 25 years, I think we've hit six twice. And that's not typically considered high inflation. I mean, it's high. I mean, it's especially on today's terms, but it's not. I mean, hyperinflation is 50% a month, not 50% a year even. Right. So, yeah, I I guess, you know, when I think about inflation and you say, well, just because we have inflation, that doesn't mean rent prices are going to go up. I mean, what is inflation then? Is it specific to every single individual asset type and, and expense that a consumer would have? Like you could make the same argument, like just because there's inflation doesn't mean bananas are going to be more expensive. The price of bananas has nothing to do with inflation. It's strictly related to the relationship between the supply of bananas and the demand for bananas. I mean, isn't it the case that when we experience widespread inflation, there's a consumer mindset shift that comes with that? where it's like people just automatically assume that a dollar today is going to be worth, I'm going to mix this up, worth more than a dollar tomorrow. And so there's like a baked in, that's almost what makes it so poisonous, right? As you get this mindset of like, there's this baked in feeling that my dollar is becoming worth less and less and less quickly. So I better pay more for this apartment now, even though I feel like it's too expensive and demand and supply really haven't changed Am I missing something here? Well, I think, I, I mean, I, I, would, I, would, I would change it and say that inflation is, I mean, that's the other problem with this idea of inflation having, in, in, inflation is the, it, it, is goods cost more tomorrow than they, they cost more today than they did yesterday. I mean, right. all, you know, not just one good and not because of supply chain issues or, or, or something like that. It is, the overall increase in goods and services in an economy. Um, you could you could make the argument if that truly happens, and I'm not going to make this argument, by the way, because I don't want to wade into that, but you could make the argument that if bananas and gasoline and food and services are all more expensive, there will be less money available for housing than more. So this idea that you can then somehow magically expect people to pay more um, and the and the reality is is your. I mean, I, I think I made this point on 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 Twitter. You can't go to uh, you you can't go to a tenant and say my expenses are higher this year than they were last year. Therefore, you have to pay more money. <laughs> I 100% agree tenant, with you. I, I wish I could. Uh, I wish I could record. Uh, you know, engrave that and send it to all my clients who seem to think that just because yeah, their property yeah, taxes and, went up and, that uh, well, can you tell my tenant that my tax it's like. No, that's not how this works. Well, that's a that that's a great one. I mean, I I have this discussion in my class where where people talk about expensive rel, expensive relative to rent. The thing that makes real estate really really hard is you have to balance expense. You have to balance the cost of maintaining the property with what the property can throw off in revenue. And if you can't get that balance right, you're you're going to lose money. Right. It doesn't it doesn't matter how good you are. And most of the time you can't do much about the rent. Correct. Now you can, you can operate it better. You can, you can maintain it better. You can do a better job, you know, so you don't get your vacancy loss problems with your credit, or your tenants. I mean, there are things that you can absolutely do in active management. And that's the marginal difference between what makes a good operator and a shitty operator. Right. Yep. But the, the, the market, I mean, I, I had this conversation with, uh, so, um, I did a coming out of the recession. I, I, you know, like everybody else, the market was in the, it was, was struggling. And I fortunately got, um, a, a ton of bank business from one of the portfolio lenders that law that essentially had their entire portfolio of subprime assets go upside down and every, and they didn't securitize those loans. So they had them all in the books. And so I helped wade through their properties in New York and the, in New York state, essentially. 
And um, they had a bunch of properties in Newburgh, New York. Newburgh, New York is right across the water from Beacon. Uh, it's It used, to, at one point in time, it was the wealthiest, as far as I understand, the wealthiest um, municipality in New York State because of its location on the Hudson and its, and its industry at the time. It is now essentially a... Um, you know, there's no jobs there, lots of crime, lots of gang problems, high unemployment, no, no opportunity for employment growth. Um, it, it's, but you drive around this, the, the, the town of Newburgh and the houses are gorgeous because they were built, you know, a hundred years ago by barons that were, you know, so the housing stock is pretty. Um, the problem is, is real estate taxes. There are $12,000, $15,000 a year. Oh, man. And the rents on those properties are $400 a month. Yeah, it just doesn't work. Yeah, I, I have forget this discussion about paying with, utilities. Forget yeah. about yeah. I have this discussion with clients sometimes, especially folks who are looking at uh, C class and D class properties, yep. which we don't like to manage. And the rents are just like you said. The rents are four hundred, five hundred, six hundred a month. And I'm like, listen, there is a floor to what it costs to operate a habit a habitable unit. Right. And the cost of a new toilet does not care how much your rent is. You can't just yep. take 10% of the rent and assume you can spend 10% of the rent on expenses. That's not how it works, right? right. Like, so, uh, you know, there's a there's just a bare minimum cost to maintain four walls, a floor and a ceiling as a habitable space for someone to live. And that right. number is probably like three or $400 a month once you factor in property taxes uh, maintenance, cost of capital, uh, capex, and everything else, let right. alone property management. So, yeah. Anyway, um, we're getting up on an hour here. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, we had a good question come in from Twitter. Uh, what's the hairiest makes me shiver in the night deal you've ever done? Uh, any horror yes. stories from doing deals? Yeah, you know, I had, I, 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 I saw that one, and I wanted to, I wanted to. I put some thought into that. I, you know, I, I, uh, I have to say that it was, um, so I had in, in, I had, uh, this is a, you know, we peaked, New York peaked in probably 2019. We're a little bit ahead of the rest of the market. Um, and I had, a a client who I had sold an estate property for them uh, a number of years ago and they overseas, they live in, 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 in the middle East and uh, out of the blue was contacted and by them and their father was selling or their father passed away and the brother is managing a property mm -hmm. in, in California and they were selling it for a huge amount of money and she needed to do a 1031 and she wanted to buy in New York. And it was, it was a lot of money. And the um, problem was cap rates were super low. You sell for a ton of money in California for a super low cap rate and you want to buy in, in you're going to be buying into a low cap rate environment. So the stress of that putting allocating those dollars was the thing that I think, if you want to say sort of keeps me awake at night is, yeah. is when you have to buy stuff in a very, very high market, which I, I think a lot of what I say on Twitter is sort of reflects this, that sometimes it's better not to buy. I totally um, agree with that. And even, and yeah. when you and when you have to, it's, it's one of those things where, and, and you just sort of pray that the market is that, and, you know, I think she, I mean, COVID, she, you know, like everybody else, you know, her, her, the assets, I mean, the assets she bought were, um, were improved, uh, extremely well renovated, decent location, um, you know, and she knew what she was buying going in. Um, and I think she did okay from, she's doing, she was doing okay until, COVID hit, but everyone's doing crappy since COVID hit. But, um, um, but yeah, that's the, you know, it's, I love it when the market is not super down like it is now. <laughs> and I don't like it when it's super high, when we're in the middle where everyone's sort of, where you can see what it, where a deal makes sense mm -hmm. and everybody does well. And you, at, you're at the table and everybody's smiling, you know, that, that's kind of when, that's the, even though you work for it, I'm not suggesting we didn't work for it. I don't want you to tell me my commissions are too high. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, when the market's crazy, it's, uh, that's, that's stressful. I mean, partly yeah. because I take, I take, uh, my advisory role pretty seriously. So, um, uh, yeah, that's, 
that's rough. Yeah. But I've had some fun ones. I've had, I had a, I had a deal where, uh, uh, there was a hammer at a closing being threatened by another family member. Oh my gosh. I mean, it, was, it was crazy. I've had some, I've had some crazy ones, but those are probably not a pro- podcast appropriate. <laughs> yeah. People get very emotionally attached to their real estate, you know, whether it's a home or, or even a commercial property, it, it's very personal for people. So, well, I yeah. appreciate your time so much, Kevin. This has been really fun. I can already envision uh, having you back again to to do uh, some more discussions around the iBuyer and and uh, the history of how we got to the for commission sure. splits that we have and everything else. So, um, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, how can people appreciate connect it. with you and uh, and learn more about what you're up to? Sure. Uh, best way is probably um, on Twitter. I'm at uh, at Cribdilla. It's C R I B D I L L A. Um, and you can DM me. DMs are open. I'm happy to uh, engage in any way I can. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for uh, listening to another episode of Owner Occupied, and that's all for today. Mm-hmm.